Welcome, everyone, to this year's iteration of the Senior Scholars Series of the Emeritus College. Uh, it is 3.32, and I just realized as I was about to begin that when I used to run student field trips, uh, we would be very hard-nosed about punctuality. And if we told people the bus was leaving at 3.30, we would pull out at 3.30 and those who hadn't made it back in time learned a hard lesson. But that hard lesson doesn't work on this medium because the people who haven't yet joined uh, can do so at their leisure at any time to come. So we've pulled the bus out of the station, uh, but folks will still be clamoring up the sides as we go forward. Uh, so be it. I hope that the addition of people uh, through the next little while isn't uh, disruptive as we get underway. I'll begin, as we usually do, by recognizing that UBC's various campuses are situated on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Salatooth, and Silix peoples. And I would add to that that I expect that there are some people listening in today who are joining us from other places near and far one of the advantages of being on Zoom and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. I should also remind those of you who haven't noticed that this event is being recorded and you will receive notification when the video is available on the Emeritus College website. So my name is Graham Wynne and I am the past principal of the Emeritus College this year, I am the organizer, convener of the Senior Scholars Series. And some of you may not realize that the Senior Scholars Series has been running for better than a decade now. It began when we had no Emeritus College, but an association of professors emeriti and Judy Hall and others uh, had the brainwave of inviting senior colleagues, emeritus colleagues, uh, to reflect on their lives and to convey something of the passion that drove academic lives in a series of talks. Those were held for close to a decade at Green College, uh, in person, in the coach house, and they showed us a remarkable range of passions and careers from a variety of colleagues from all across the university. Last year, when the pandemic descended upon us, it was no longer possible to meet in person at Green College. And so we elected to transition the series onto the Zoom platform. And we realized that there were both pluses and minuses to that transition. Uh, there's no doubt that the medium is the message and that in-person meetings allow a certain kind of conviviality and interaction that this medium does not. But this one has the great advantage of allowing people who otherwise might not be able to make it to the campus to participate in the meetings uh, and to hear what our speakers have to say. And it also allows effective recording so that those who can't attend at the time can take in the series at their leisure. So we are persisting with the Zoom format through this year. We have half a dozen speakers lined up. Uh, I think a really interesting and very diverse group of people. And you can find the details of their uh, talks on the UBC Emeritus College website. Uh, they're about every month on a Tuesday afternoon at 3.30. So you should have no difficulty in finding it. And we do send out regular alerts and there will be information in the newsletter about upcoming events as well. So uh, we are in this Zoom world and our intention really is to continue with it uh, through this series. When we moved to Zoom, we decided that it would be advantageous to change up the format of the series a little bit. 
in Green College. Those of you who attended will remember uh, the invited colleague was asked to give a 50 minute lecture about the passions that drove their academic careers. And that was followed by a question period. Uh, a 50 minute lecture to a series of thumbnails is not quite the same experience as talking to a room in which you can identify friends and read the body language. So we move to a moderated format in which we have a moderator to interact with the senior scholar presenting. And last year, that moderator position was filled by Jerry Wasserman. Uh, this year, we have a new moderator, uh, Rodri Windsor Liscombe from the Department of uh, Art History, Visual Arts and Theory. Uh, Rodri had a long and, and distinguished career at UBC. Uh, but before he came to the West Coast, he attended the Courtauld Institute in London, taught at the Open University, at the University of London and McGill University, and then at UBC joined the Art History, Visual Art and Theory Department, although it probably was called something else when Rodri joined. Uh, he also served the institution uh, as director of the individual uh, studies graduate program and as head of that department with the long name that always causes me to <laughs> tangle my feet and uh, was for a while associate dean in the faculty of graduate studies. Rodri is a man with wide and lively interests and I'm really grateful to him for taking on the moderator's role. I'm also really impressed and grateful that Zoom has allowed us in this first event in particular to span the country. Rodri is in Nova Scotia and our speaker today, Dugila Moodley, is on Pender Island. So we really literally are ocean to ocean here. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get up to the Arctic to make this a trifecta. <laughs> but uh, it is wonderful that we can do this uh, with such a, a widespread cast of, of uh, participants. So without further ado, I will hand things over to Rodri. Uh, but just as I do that, I would thank Kagila for agreeing to uh, meet with us today uh, to share her reflections. I'm certainly very much looking forward to it. And so Rodri and Kagila, Please, it's your show. Well, I'm really delighted to, and honored uh, to be part of this series. And um, I would like, if I may begin, because all of you know uh, from the site uh, how distinguished Kugila is as both a scholar and a humanitarian. And I'd like to put up a latest book, uh, which many of you will have seen, and some of you I'm sure will have written, and Kugila, if you'll allow me just to say a few words, um, I found this a fascinating blend of biography and societal analysis across time and space, but deeply sad in terms of the unjust treatment of your family in particular, the fact that your family was evicted quite improperly under the apartheid laws from your house. But that sadness is interwoven with great humor and very deep insight onto our human condition. And I won't obtrude too much because I think my job is to prompt your insight and experience. But I was particularly fascinated with a phrase um, about a visit which you made with your hus husband, um, um, Herbert Adam, uh, to North Street in Durban, where, where you grew up. Barren and unused is the phrase about the, de the demolition of a whole series of houses. And it seemed to me it encapsulated the harsh core of imperialism, but also of racial and ethnic bigotry. And you point out, I think too, unfortunately, alas, that uh, racism and bigotry is not racially or physically confined but was clearly especially destructive in South Africa when you were growing up. 
So I wonder if you could tell us some more about your upbringing and I think bring forward and not, not only your resilience, but that marvelous resilience of your parents. Thank you very much, Rodri, and um, for your kind comments. Um, I first of all want to apologize for the, uh, the fact that the, the American publisher of my book has put such a heavy price on it that is almost inaccessible to Canadians. And it's still a private battle that I'm engaged in, but be that as it may, um, we do the best with, uh, with what we can to, to subvert it. Um, so to, you asked me to say something about uh, my childhood. Am I correct? Yes, indeed. Well, it was a very interesting childhood in that it combined many aspects of both privilege and underprivilege and discrimination and um, retaliation. All of those things came together in some ways. First of all, I came from a family where contrary to stereotypes about the way in which men, Indian men were supposed to be treating Indian women, um, I, I, my birth was celebrated contrary to most other Indian families where the young bo the boy child was the one they, uh, they looked forward to most. So I started out right away with a bit of a heads up there. Um, and as I will show, Indians in South Africa, growing up as an Indian child, um, compared to other minorities in South Africa, also had relative privilege. So there was that aspect as well. And I, I will say more about this later. But more than anything else, um, what growing up in South Africa did for one is um, it made you aware of the, the ways in which human beings can treat each other with no sense of embarrassment or um, feelings of uh, remorse about what they do to each other. So in a way, one worked together with people where you were both visible and invisible. And that, that gradation took place along the lines of a pigmentocracy. If you were Indian, you were slightly better off. You had certain privileges. You could live in the city. If you were an African, you couldn't. And all of those, the amount of uh, money allocated to educational opportunity, again, was graded according to the color of your skin. It was really a pigmentocracy. And so these are the things you grew up with. And from birth to death, your life was determined um, where you lived, where you went to school, uh, the hospitals you went to, the uh, doctors you attended were, had separate uh, waiting rooms. Every single aspect of life was determined according to the color of your skin. And so I'll, I'll do that by way of an introduction. Yes, well, and of course we should say, since we've had the American Open, that you actually had lessons from Rod Laver, one of the lovely little incidents in your book. But of course, the, the, I mean, the deeper sadness you also brought up was about where shark nets were placed and where people were allowed to go. But I think you should tell us a little bit, Kugila, if it's not too upsetting, about the eviction of your parents, because I thought that was a truly awful uh, if uh, part yeah. of the book, you know. Let me just clarify that statement about Rod Laver. That was <laughs> an interesting, that was a one-time, a one-time lesson, but it was also so an, <laughs> an example of, of Indian parents banding together to avoid being uh, thrown out of clubs and everywhere else 
to have their own club. And in that club, Rod Laver with, for these aspiring parents invited him in the hopes that he might turn us into um, tournament uh, level performers, which unfortunately we, most of us didn't make. <laughs> but but that, that is a bit of a telling detail. Um, and the other point you raised, Graham, was... Well, well really, what, what happened to, you, put to your parents and all your family um, with, with no yeah. just cause whatsoever? Yeah. Um, you know, the South African government had a plan to totally segregate, to, to finish the segregation completely. So the idea was to move people out of areas that were borderline um, for, uh, that had some degree of integration into totally separate ones. So in that context, my family happened to be, uh, happened to have a home in an area that was declared white. And that meant that although the home was owned by them, we were required to vacate and leave for an area out of town. There were no, it was not like you could go to a real estate agent and go and buy another piece of property easily, but it really meant a total dislocation of people. And I think perhaps that is best indicated um, in, a, in a piece from my book that I would like to read, actually. It, it, it tells about the day um, a man came to deliver the notice and a little bit of, of that description. May I do that? Please do. Okay. So one beautiful summer's day in 1961, I had just returned home from university. My classes ended early on that day. I was enjoying tea with our neighbor, a lawyer, Reggie Ngobo, who lived down the road and had dropped by to ask if my father had time to join for a doubles tennis match on the weekend. Although he was a prominent successful lawyer, he was forced to live in the domestic living quarters at the back of a colored family's home on the street because black South Africans were not allowed to own property in the city. After a while, there was a knock at the front door. Three white men in formal dark suits and hats asked to come in to serve a notice to us. Immediately, I thought they had come because of our black neighbor, who was, strictly speaking, living illegally in the city, albeit at the back of someone's house. Was it because interracial social contact was frowned upon? My mind raced to the thought that there was nothing illegal in the social contact. It did not even involve any alcohol it was unlawful under apartheid to offer alcohol to a person of color, but we were both persons of color. I ushered them in. They looked critically at Reggie sitting confidently and comfortably on the sofa with a cup of tea in his hand. After all, in the custom of white South Africans, Indians and blacks were meant to be serving, not served. I did not offer them a seat. They stood at the door with a sheet of paper, conviction order, informing us that we had to vacate our own freehold home. They drew my attention to the stipulation that the house was to be fumigated at our own cost prior to vacating. These, they pointed out, were the regulations under the Group Areas Act. They offered this information deadpan, expressionless, and unfeeling. I was fuming. They needed us to sign that we had received this notice. Sensing the seriousness of the situation, Reggie offered to leave. I asked him to stay. 
Then I turned to these bearers of bad news and said, how do you feel about doing this job? Do you know what it means to be forced to leave your own home because of some racist government planning? Do you think this is fair? They looked down to avoid my gaze. Then I exercised the only other source of power left to me. I will not sign this now. You will have to come back after my father has seen and read it. They left expressionless without another word. I wondered what Reggie was thinking, that he couldn't even have a chance to be evicted because he was never allowed to own a place in the city to begin with, though he could well have bought several houses. This moment brought home to me yet again my relative privilege as an Indian South African, a member of a middle ethnic group. I too, despite, despite our indentured and ancestral roots, was a beneficiary of a racially ranked apartheid society. So that was an amazing experience, which uh, to crown it all, the factor of not only having to leave your home, but to fumigate it was an example of the vermin-like condition in which minorities were um, considered. Yeah. And oh, it's awful. But I mean, after that, I mean, I, I was hugely impressed is a weak word about how your parents dealt with that and in a sense protected you to some degree from the awful nastiness of that situation. Yeah, I, I think that you see parents in that situation face a twofold um, dilemma and a quandary actually is what they're in. On the one hand, they want to protect and empower you that you have power. You have, you're not totally a victim. You can always stand up for what you are. And that always came through. On the other hand, they also wanted to raise you as a person who respected other people. And I can remember some rather awful uh, examples of where I tried my power very, very badly. And that is when we went on, on the bus into the city, uh, living in this mixed area at the time, um, we were only allowed to sit in the last three um, seats of the bus upstairs of the double-decker bus. So we always had, we got great delight in fighting with the white bus conductor. And one day when, he, when the bus was empty and I said, I think I'd like to sit downstairs. He said to me, you get upstairs. So I was so angry. When we came down, I pulled the most awful uh, line on him. I said, if I were you, I would do better than being a bus conductor. <laughs> and I went home proudly and told my mother that I'd said this. And she said to me, you should be ashamed of yourself. That man is, no matter who he is, is doing an honorable job and you have no right to say that to him. So I, I think these were the things, you see, you were always testing your limits and you also said horrible things. So anyway, that was yes, funny. Well, I, I, no, I, I think in a way, can I move to something I found really interesting in your writing because really throughout this book you're you're coming forward with ways that we can address this fact that we seem to love to hate um can you say some more about societal compartmentalization versus your idea of cosmopolitanism and and give us a bit more of your definition because i found that a very interesting beginning we'll come back to this in terms of political li literacy but maybe you, we could start off there Okay, um, you know, my book is really a, com it, it's, it's a different kind of thing to anything I've ever done before. I've written both 
Um, I've written more theoretically in the past, but this was an attempt to use personal experience as a vignette, as vignettes or uh, as intros into, into um, uh, broader principles. Mm -hmm. So um, in doing that, one of the things I'm doing in this book is to show the question, questionable nature um, of the use of the term culture mm -hmm. in the way in which we include it in public policy and the way in which it has been used to both divide and rule. Um, in that regard, um, in South Africa, culture was used um, presumably with the rationale that people will live more harmoniously if they're separated and able to maintain their own, um, their own ways of life and language and culture and so on. Um, clearly, the idea was divide and rule. When I came to Canada, culture was being used in a very different kind of way. Culture was being used in a way to incorporate other groups and multiculturalism um, was aimed at the idea that um, if you make a space for everyone, you incorporate them into the body politic and you, you give an equal recognition. It was all about recognition. It's not totally unproblematic. Let me give you an example. When I came to, to UBC, um, one of my, one of the very well-meaning vice presidents at the time advised me um, that in order to make it, and he was a person of color, I might say, that in order to make it, I should join one of the uh, ethnic groups. Now, I had come from a society where I was running away from that. And suddenly here I was recognizing or being told that you won't make it if you didn't join one of those groups. And so it, it's really, it, it was not really totally unproblematic, the use of culture, even in its most benign uh, manner to, um, to also encapsulate people. So uh, here I am, I'm an Indian from South Africa. Somebody asked me, do you speak Punjabi? I said, no, I don't. Do you speak Hindi? I said, no, I don't. Um, so I, I pulled out the only thing I could find a little bit. I do speak Tamil, I said, because I was sent to Tamil school and learned it very badly. Oh, he said, what kind of an Indian is that? So I think the whole thing is that you suddenly faced a re-aggregation of how culture was being defined in this society. So um, I think one of the things that um, came to mind uh, as I was navigating my way through uh, the Canadian scene is that we've got to be very, very careful about the way in which we use culture. For that reason, and also, culture is seen as very homo homogenizing. It's seen as people looking the same are all alike. And so it can have the same kind of primordialist aspects and become a substitute for the term race. So that was the other thing. Since my book is international, I also experienced contestations with culture in the German situation. Mm -hmm. When I arrived in Germany, um, I, my background is very complicated. I had to leave South Africa because I met a German uh, person who uh, under South African law um, made me very culpable under the Immorality Act. 
And therefore I had to leave South Africa. So anyway, I land in Germany. And again, it was the time in Germany when um, new immigrants from um, Italy were being taken in as guest workers. And so I entered as an Indian South African. Um, at that point, I, I, part of a scholarship I had to study in Germany was to learn German. So I had four months of German and I learned enough to be able to fake a kind of restricted code. But the way in which Germans received me was very interesting compared to Italians. They told me that I was so much better than those Italians. My culture was so much higher. And look at those Italians, they said, they can only babble. And here you are, you've come for a little while and you can speak German. So again, culture was being put into a hierarchy and I was given a, a little bit of a higher status than the Italian immigrants at the time. Mm. Um, I could well, go on. No, well, of course you. Oh, please do. I, I don't mean to interrupt you. Do you, do you want to go further with that? If if not, I'm going to suggest that sure. since you brought in um, Heribert, uh, you might talk a little bit about the um, relationship, the interchange that you both had uh, with Nelson Mandela, who seemed to be a person who had, how can we say it, a deeper perception of how you could move beyond these harsh lines of division. Yeah, that was a very, uh, a very interesting episode in our lives. And it partly speaks to how we both came to do research together and what we brought into the research experience. Since I came from South Africa, um, I was very critical of listening to all voices and one has to admit that. When I listened to whites talking about their willingness to change, we always took it with a gram of salt and thought, do they really mean it? When Heribert came to South Africa, he was able, because he was German, to open avenues of uh, contact with Afrikaners, which I was never able to do. Mm -hmm. And so he was able to see that they were willing at that point to negotiate and have a better life. That as oh, this is window dressing. They do it just because you're a German and they and you're an outsider and they want to impress you. But he went further than than that. He kept pushing them along lines to see how much more they would be willing to yield, and whether they really did in fact mean there were there were windows and possibilities. With that in mind. We then took a slightly different view. We were more open. And he um, and I both wrote a book called South Africa Without Apartheid, in which we examined the potential for transformation, which we had not looked at before. We were, we were considering mainly in each other in adversarial terms. And so that kind of insight into a potential window, even in the oppressor, opened up an enormous, um, an enormous window. Um, he talked about the Afrikaners being ready to modernize racial domination, which was very interesting and annoying to most of us, because modernize seemed to echo a positivity. On the other hand, Afrikaners were extremely delighted to be presented as people who were open to the world. So all of that led to this book, South Africa Without Apartheid, which really began to unpack 
this, these potential scenarios. So when, when the book had, was published, we were for a term at the Institute for Intercultural Studies at the University of Cape Town. And there was an Africana who had become a, a Quaker who had good contacts with Winnie Mandela. So we asked him if he would consider getting this book to Nelson Mandela, who was then at Paulsmore Prison. Mandela uh, had been obviously talking to the Africanas. And Anyway, so this, this friend agreed and we gave him two books, one for the commandant of the prison in order to suck up to get in. And the other book was for Nelson Mandela. So he went in and he said, he came back with good news. The commandant is willing for me to give this to the prisoner, but it will be put in a, a prison library. Anyway, about two months later, we received a handwritten note from Paulsmore Prison from Nelson Mandela. And that letter is just unbelievable. It, it was written in perfect uh, script, like a schoolboy script, you know, perfect. And he said how much he thanked us for the gesture of bringing this book to him, which he had already begun reading and was deeply moved by it. So he said, would you have time to pass by the prison and autograph this book for me? Because only then can I have the book to read away from the, the prison library and have a little more time to finish it. So of course, we could not believe this. We thought this is a coded message. He wants to meet with us. So we got all togged up and went to the prison. But now the question of the commandant seeing a mixed couple might upset the whole thing. So I strategically suggested I will wait in the car you go. It's more important we succeed than create another barrier. So Herbert reluctantly went on his own and he waited with the commandant. The commandant sent in and then came back and said, I'm sorry, you cannot meet with Mr. Mandela. You'd need permission from Pretoria for that, but you can autograph the book. So it has an autograph in it. And when Mandela left the prison, it was one of the few books in his few boxes of personal items that he took with him, we were told, by the doctor who examined him. Anyway, that was- yes, and I think you met again later, didn't you? We did indeed. But of course, very short, um, brief social meetings and, um, Mandela with his characteristic uh, underplaying says, you know, we have met before, but you of course won't remember it. So <laughs> that, was, that was a Mandela moment, you know? Well, look in passing, we have to say that you and Heribert have had a marvelous collaboration together. I mean, both in your marriage and in your academic work. I mean, you've published at least five major books together, haven't you? Yes. And I, I think that's sort of part of where I'd like to move with uh, now, if you're agreeable, um, to say more about your travel as a teacher and academic. Um, you've taught across boundaries and you've been teaching to cross boundaries, social and cultural. And it would be great if you'd say some more about that aspect of your career. Yeah, um, <clears throat> teaching in different contexts taught me quite a lot. Uh, my first teaching experience was at a college in, in South Africa, which 
was for Indians only. And that was, a, that was an experiment of the apartheid government, which we, uh, which we were very much against. And in the end, when there seemed no, no other alternative, I took that opportunity and went back there to teach sociology. Didn't last very long, but that's a whole different episode and takes too much time to go there. In that context, I learned the importance of um, teaching. I was teaching Indian students. Uh, they had enough biases against Africans. So my job in that situation was to open up their vision about the country in which we live and about how injustice was experienced across the board. And so I had to focus it very much along those lines. I also at the same time had to open their view of the world because they were very encapsulated in that small setting. So that was my first experience. Coming to Canada, um, my, my very first experience at the University of British Columbia was to teach a course at the, um, in the First Nations program on the, on the North Van Reserve. That was for me quite an eye opener too, because they were only First Nations students. And how do you make concepts, abstract concepts in sociology meaningful to those students. Sociology can be difficult for, for the best of students anywhere, but for students in the situation of First Nations students, I found it extremely important that I tailor those concepts to each, to, to their condition, namely, how do marginalized groups respond to oppression in different international con content, con contexts um, in order to accomplish several things. The limits of encapsulation in one's own situation and a greater political awareness of how one brings about change and what are the avenues. So that was my, my next episode. The third part of my teaching at UBC was in two alternative programs. One of them was um, called LISTEN, which was geared to teaching in lower income uh, schools on the east side of the city. And so these were alternative programs aimed at, at education, educating young students who were about to become teachers about what they need to consider in low income groups, and in areas and so on. So it was quite a valuable experience. However, what I found is we were giving them more political education with very little about what to actually do and how to actually accomplish that. The other obstacle we faced was that the teachers and the school placements were being a little bit hesitant about having a label lower income. So gradually, the, the, the shift came to make that program a program for teaching in multicultural, uh, a multicultural teacher education program, where the focus then became what teachers considered to be more positive as compared to what they considered lower income to be negative. So these were things I'd learned. Finally, I want to add another thing. The challenges I faced as a person of color, teaching uh, multicultural education with a strong component of anti-racism education to classes which were um, of very mixed origins. And what I found good about that was the minority students could relate very much to me and they felt safe about opening up and, and exper expressing themselves 
and talking about their own experiences. I also noticed that the non-minority students seized up and became a lot more closed. What was my role as a teacher to open up that avenue and to avoid the compartmentalization into oppressor and oppressed? Because immediately you locked them into those situations. And so one approach I found worked for me quite well was in my initial class meeting, I asked them to talk about why they had come to that class. And I was amazed at how students had traveled, they had learned other languages. They were so full of resources themselves. But immediately we talked about anti-racism, they shut up and you had this, this silence. And some students who'd never spoken before came out extremely openly. So there were some compensations. So my first approach was uh, to request that each of them write a three pager outlining the journey of their family into Canada. The uh, experiences they had in finding jobs, the experiences they had in using the languages they came with, or the backgrounds or the countries from which they came, or the credentials that they brought with them. That created the most wonderful opener I can ever imagine. Because suddenly the students who came also from European background talked about the fact that their parents who had training couldn't work in those areas, uh, the fact that they had language problems and so on. So there were unifying themes that came out without denying that some might have been more difficult than others but it really did open up a conversation. And as a teacher, I felt that that was a very important caveat to avoid the kind of silencing that is taking place when we do get into, um, into just this compartmentalization. So mm -hmm. the question then, in many instances, many of us who are members of minorities can quite easily retract into very warm and comfortable situations where we also overemphasize our own superior cultures and so on. It's very easy to happen when you're doing uh, something like, um, um, for example, the whole business of what Biko did in, in South Africa was in a much more positive way, black consciousness, because it brought together groups who were oppressed across the line. But in this case, it's very easy to feel that you have a much better background and therefore you want to glorify this. And what that does is also artificially creates barriers with others. So I think we, we, in a situation like this, we really have to be very, very uh, cognizant of keeping the lines open. And the lines open mean looking where we, our barriers keep outsiders from getting to know each other. Now, whether that's called cosmopolitanism or not, I think my, my move is yes, I think we've gone too far the other way in our attempt to glorify culture as a way of incorporation and recognition, we have lost sight of the vision we need to look at what kind of a society do we need to cultivate? Yeah. What kind of do we need to cultivate? And everything speaks very, very loud and clear. We need to build not only our own recognition, but the, the connections with others. Um, and that is an area which we can easily throw out in our, in our zeal to address uh, inequality. Yeah. Anyway, so much. Well, no, Kugila, I think at this point, I, uh, we should say that 
uh, coming up soon in about uh, eight or nine minutes, we're going to open uh, to all you colleagues who are kindly part of this conversation for questions. But before we do that, can I um, take the time to ask you more about a very interesting concept you've got. Um, really political literacy is, is what I'm referring to. Uh, how to realize in a sense to um, Max Weber's concept of the ideal interests uh, and alter a negative and neg negatory mindset. I think it'd be very helpful, um, particularly at this time, if you talk more on that, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think Weber's ideal interests um, really bear a significant opening up. We need we need to re revisit those again. Um, let me let me say more about political literacy in that regard. What I mean by political literacy is um, not what happened in South Africa where political literacy was really um, cultivating um, a sense of what it means to have good civic education and so on. I think more is needed and was needed. We learned from that exercise. Political literacy really requires critical analysis. It requires opening up uh, moral education without preaching. It really, uh, it is to enable people and students to, to make moral, uh, educated, um, and ethically considered judgments. So in order to do that, it's really, it really needs a broadening of anti-racism education. Political literacy requires an understanding of the incremental ways in which uh, oppression takes place. The, the ways in which microaggressions lock people into positions. Political education requires and opening up of all of those channels of how gradually you move from one to the other. You know, it's interesting if you take the South African case that in, in 1994, when Mandela was opening up South Africa, what happened in Rwanda is a perfect example of how gradually people who lived together were able to utilize uh, the, uh, the existing pol uh, politicization in the society to make friends and neighbors into enemies whom they slaughtered en masse. And that kind of political education is absolutely necessary for every single society to look at the ways in which power works to keep people locked into positions and how we need to, to work to get at those understandings of, of the way in which uh, it works and political literacy is critical to that. Yes. Well, no, I understand from my own field. Um, I mean, it's very interesting to consider. I've written quite a lot about architecture in America you know, the different viewpoints people would have of a classical column as put into a courthouse, for example. And uh, we're carrying all the sense of authority, but of course, meaning something entirely different to different groups of people, particularly if there are people who are being, I shouldn't perhaps use the word oppressed, but frankly, that's true by the law. Mm. Agree. Well, I think we can move to questions, but I'd just love to finish because you're gonna go back to South Africa in a sense, because we began there to see your grandmother, who I think is now 106. Yes, 
My grandmother is 106 and is perhaps one of the most uh, influential uh, people in my life. Um, I mean, what she was able to bring home to us was the impact of Gandhian principles. Um, and I, I didn't actually mention that episode of my life, but, you know, um, she taught us a lot about tolerance and working towards incorporating difference in our lives. When we think about all of the students who came to live in our home, who were African students not able to, to meet curfew uh, requirements and be out at, at night and so on. I mean, she really opened up the house and this is where we got started. But I, I did want to add one episode, which I, I, didn't, uh, I, I didn't mention. And that is in my class at school in, in Durban was the daughter of Mahatma Gandhi. Oh. And she was a deep, uh, close friend of mine who took me to live uh, at the uh, ashram, which Gandhi had set up. But never in my entire schooling was the word Gandhi ever mentioned, despite the fact that Gandhi's granddaughter was in my classroom. And this is the way in which colonial education, with no knowledge of who they were teaching, worked to undermine the sense of what resources you brought into into education. And my mother was the counteracting force that brought all of that back to us and kept us geared. So. Well, well thank you. Now, we, uh, so far we only have one question, I'm afraid, but it's a very good one from Charles Ungerleiter. Are there tenets or principles of political literacy? So Kugila, over to you. <laughs> Yeah, I think the tenets of political literacy are basically critical inquiry. The ability to unpack how your society works, how power is dispensed, who, who has access to resources, who does not. Political literacy, um, requires unpacking your own society in that way, but it also requires comparative analysis. Comparative analysis is something which looks at how different societies have, uh, have handled oppression and um, unbelievable in humanity to one another. So one of the things I learned when I, for example, uh, lived in Germany, how was that Nazi experience used to educate people? If you want critical analysis, you need to look at every society and look at how they experienced it, how they got there and how they dealt with it. And it, it was very moving for me to come across signs which were placed on buildings, innocuous buildings I would visit. Who lived here? Where did they go to? Why were they moved from here? Where did they land up? You walked on the streets and you, you saw little brass plaques which recorded which building was here. When was it destroyed? That kind of critical analysis, it leads you to critical analysis. It leads you to look at how we got there and where we are today. So I think, you know, simply, simply um, using formats that glorify uh, and, and give information about other cultures is insufficient. You really need critical analysis to open up that, that view and understanding um, that transcends um, 
who, who we are in terms of our cultural backgrounds and so on. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. Well, I'm, I'm sure Charles will come back, but Peter Dodek has asked uh, too. Kugeli, you mentioned the importance of preserving connections among groups while celebrating individual cultures. So Peter's interested in know what are the successful ways of preserving connections and what is the metric of that success? And furthermore, what are your recommendations for preserving connections among groups here in BC? Well, I think that um, connections would come out of developing common projects. Common projects that meet the needs of a much broader community. I mean, we really need to unpack that term community because people often make the assumption that your community is your primordial one. And I think one way to do that is to develop um, areas of common interest. We cannot survive without living in a safe environment. We cannot survive without being in a climate uh, conscious society. All these are openings where people can come together to, and in doing so transcend the specificity of their origins. And I think those are avenues which we really, really need to, to further, you know? Yes. Well, Graham's, Graham Wins asked, uh, first of all, thanking you, Kugila. Would you care to share your thoughts about comparative critical analysis of the South African and the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commissions? Yeah, um, well, the South African Truth Commission played a, a remarkable role as a, an educational tool. It, um, it opened up in 50 segments or more where the individual studies, individual uh, cases were opened up to the general public in all of their horror. So no one can say they didn't know about it. Um, of course, there were many problems with the Truth Commission in South Africa in that it didn't go far enough in including all of the, uh, the uh, groups involved. It also, in the interest of, um, of achieving uh, a negotiated settlement, glossed over a lot of very, very serious um, uh, transgressions. For example, the Winnie Mandela uh, issue of her behavior towards the, the youth that she was involved in. Um, so in the interest of, of that, that kind of stuff, the other thing was that the compensations promised to people, African, poor African people who came to tell their stories never really got followed through. And so in that context, they told their stories and they told their stories and again were victimized because, well, they weren't victimized, but they were totally neglected in terms of the compensations that they were afforded. But the educational value of the Truth Commission there was without doubt a, a highly valuable one. In the, in the Canadian case, I don't think we've gone far enough. It seems to me that what has been unearthed recently with the residential schools has been far more influential in opening up the case of First Nations uh, uh, history, then it didn't go with the African uh, Truth Commission. And admittedly, it was on a much smaller scale and there were various hitches in the way in which the commission actually worked. So I think it was a good beginning, but it certainly didn't go as far as the South African one, what's and all. 
Well, now there's a question from Sneja Ganev. One of the most interesting developments in critical race theory is the growth of comparisons with the Indian caste system. Um, what are your thoughts on, on, on this? No question. Um, in my chapter on political literacy, I cite it among the various forms of racism, in fact. Um, I mean, no case can be made, no cultural case can be made for uh, the caste system that still continues to operate um, in its worst forms, if not openly, uh, sub subversively, you know, from, from anything to uh, educational opportunity to the seeking of marriage partners. So, I mean, clearly in India that still operates, but on a slightly different note, it's interesting that in a migrating community like South Africa from India, where the number of women indentured laborers were relative, were very, very low compared to, uh, to men, the caste system completely disappeared. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an interesting case of how um, culture and, and tradition also shift when it comes to economic necessity and the shortage of women um, seemed to have some effect on the fact that they could no longer ask for dowry, uh, huge dowries of uh, women's uh, families for marriage partners and so on, all so sorts of things. And, and the fact that the caste system was upset in the migration process means that that it's not an uh, um, irretrievable, unbreakable uh, system. And I think that each of those, it, it's beginning to happen in India, but tradition is something that's very, very hard to end completely. Yes. Well, um, uh, in the absence of another question, can I, bring you to, because a very interesting part of the book is, I don't know if it's the correct terminology, your taxonomy of racism and, and bigotry and associated negativity. I mean, can you tell us a little bit more? Because I think you've picked apart uh, that um, many layer beast. Mm. Not sure how to answer that question. Um, can you say a little more? Well, I'm, in the back of your book, you give very interesting definitions of the different forms of, of racism. Yes. And I think in a way, I, I perhaps didn't give you enough an opportunity to bring that out, but it kind of follows on a little bit from what you were saying in response to Snajan. Yeah, I um, yeah I do mention that. And I, I'm just going to refer to that chapter to, to um, point to my... Hmm. My category is there. Anyway, I, I talk about, uh, among other things, caste racism, economic racism, cultural racism. Um, I'm thinking of um, even sexual racism I talked about as, as a form of categories that get so deeply entrenched that they are hard to, to dislodge. Um, so those, those are some of the categories I use, but I did. Hmm? Yes. Well, I mean, I think uh, your, your work is particularly important because too of the large scale movement of people um, from one place to another. And I, I wonder if you might say a little bit more about how you see your work perhaps contributing to making possible um, a more healthy civil society in uh, an increasingly diverse uh, large communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting um, window actually. If one looks, for example, at the way in which migrants to South Africa have been treated 
in and then this is this is a worldwide phenomenon that we are having to deal with now. I mean, we haven't seen the worst of it. Um, but to, to use South Africa as a lens, here was a society that experienced racism in its worst manifestations. It was not only racism at an informal level, but it was entrenched in law. So there is no denying. Uh, the, uh, its existence. Well, how does a society like that respond to the increasing number of migrants from the rest of Africa into South Africa? It's a horrible story of the fact that because one has experienced racism, one doesn't inflict it upon others, is what comes out most horrendously in that experience because migrants to South Africa, regardless of the fact that they were from other African countries, were being scapegoated, beaten, um, burnt, robbed, and placed under the most inhumane treatments you can imagine. And when we, we went into the townships to do research on this issue, it became clear that there were certain triggers. The migrants were seen as people who had more skills than they did. Uh, the Somalis who came to South Africa were seen as banding together and being able to buy goods at cheaper prices and therefore offer them at comparative, com competitive prices within the township. The funny, the funny thing is they were accused of not offering brand name, really brand name products. They were offering fake brand name products, which tells you one thing about the lack of consumer education. I mean, here were people in the townships who were poor, but they wanted the real Gucci and the real brand names. And the, the migrants were selling them fake products. So all of these things about migrants having better skills, migrants being deceptive, migrants um, being able to take their cell phones and, and misuse them, uh, so on and so forth, made no attempt at all to bridge the gaps between other people in similar economic conditions who are coming to seek refuge. So, I think if that's a lesson in the social sciences, it's because you've experienced inequality doesn't mean that you're necessarily uh, willing to open up to others who are like you because the competitive element comes into it in, in a horrendous way. That's true. Well, I mean, since we're in the academy, as it were, um, the, the grove of the academy. Um, uh, would, uh, perhaps a, a good way to bring the, the conversation to an end is for you to say some more about your thoughts about curriculum development, for example, and where the role of the university in creating political literacy. But I'll let you deal with that as, as you would wish, because you are the founding David Lamb Professor of Multicultural uh, studies and education, and, and I think uh, it would be very interesting to have your insights at this point. Yeah, my, my thoughts on that are very, um, are really not, not completely helpful, I don't think, because all I could think of is one cannot come up with the list of what could be included other than educating the educators. Mm -hmm. the, problem, the problem that I see is as a cultural program, uh, the assumption is that if you increase knowledge about the other groups, uh, about their cultures, you will have extended uh, a greater understanding with each other. And I think that's only very, that's part of the, uh, of the situation. 
uh, or part of the, the approach. Um, you see, it takes me back to teaching a course on cultural differences in education, which I did at SFU, in which in my, in my early years as an immigrant, I had to do many jobs. And one of them was to teach a course that was made available, cultural differences in education. At the end of teaching that course, one student came up to me and said, look, I'm in this course, not for any broad education. All I want is tell me 10 things I'm allowed to do and not allowed to do with each ethnic group. And I think that just about blew it for me. And the other thing was in a casual conversation, I heard a student say, you know why black students, why, why blacks can't swim? It's because their bones are heavier. At that oh, point, I thought I should pack up the exercise and abandon the whole thing because it was the kind of cultural knowledge that was being asked was at a very simple level. So I think in terms of curriculum development, it has to be permeating throughout the whole curriculum. One has to look at what is being taught and what are the deeper meanings that one communicates beyond a simple um, cultural knowledge. And I think one, one needs also to add uh, a very, very strong component of history. Historical background needs to be incorporated. Knowledge about, about different people's experiences. It's not about their cultures and what works and what doesn't. That is only a very simple uh, part of it. But if one te treats people with respect and, and understanding of, for example, the whole of colonial education, which is still embedded in our, in our learning, deeply embedded, needs to be unpacked. And that doesn't mean you get rid of it. It means that you add to it. You understand what is there. You need to, to have it in order to show its shortcomings. It doesn't mean by removing it completely, you're doing away with it. I, I, I'm a firm believer that one needs to incorporate elements of it in order to trace history and how it works and what has been omitted, what has been left out. And that uh, requires more general educated uh, approaches of educators rather than simply a, a series of prescriptions of what should and shouldn't be incorporated, if you know what I mean. Yes. I do. Well, I don't know if there are any more questions, but um, I found this conversation really tremendously enlightening and most enjoyable. And I think the best way of really thanking you, Pugila, is to again hold up your book, because it is really not only fascinating, but a really highly articulate and full of deep insight. And I think things that are very helpful uh, not only at the larger sort of level of policy and polity, but in the way we think about how we lead our own lives. So in a sense, uh, that whole idea of helping to change our mindset about these things. So can I, on behalf of everybody, thank you for what to me was a wonderful in interchange. And I hope for all the people who were, were part of uh, the conversation this evening. Um, and just to say, I hope that you will all rejoin us again on October the 12th, when we'll have uh, a great pleasure of talking with another great scholar and person deeply interested in social justice, uh, Carol Herbert. So thank you, everybody. But thank you in particular, Kugila. I so enjoyed being in your company. Thank you. Thank you.